All right, good evening, everybody. Hello, everybody. Those in Facebook land, we want to welcome you to another edition of Liberia Shall Rise. I am Augustine Sharif, and I'm here with Mr. Emmanuel George. Mr. George, I know you're busy in the background, but how are you doing, Chief? I'm doing fine, thank you. I'm very All fine. right. All right, so um, we'd, like, we'd like to welcome each and every one of you guys. Welcome again to another edition of the show. Today, we are going to be having two guests on the show. Hopefully, we can make it through. We have guests joining us from uh, Liberia. We also have guests joining us from uh, uh, Benin. So we are going to be talking about tourism in Africa, you know, in 2023. So we'd like to invite you, share the show, invite friends to come and be part of the show. I will go ahead and play our theme song while that song is playing. We will come back and we will discuss, uh, we'll introduce our guests and bring them on the show. Stay tuned and please continue to share the show. to the show. I am your host. I'm here with Mr. Emmanuel George. And today we are going to be talking about tourism in, in Africa. Mr. George, how about you take over, introduce our guest, and let's go from there. Yeah, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see you out there in Facebook line. Again, if you're joining us, please share the show to as much as your friend as possible. My name is Emmanuel GK George, and I'm happy to be in your home this afternoon. Uh, according to Metro Trend, revenue trade uh, in the travels and tourism market is uh, projected to reach 21.54 billion in the year 2023. This revenue is about to show an annual growth rate of about 6.78, resulting in a projected market volume of $28 billion by the time we get to 2027. So the market, the largest segment of this market in trade and tourism will be taken over by hotels. Uh, and it's extremely important for us to know that according to the 
the U European intelligence unit say globally they expect a pen down demand for travel to drive to the growth growth by 30 percent inter in international tourism taking up a 1.6 billion dollars especially in the continent of africa in fact last year it was forecasted that since the end of the pandemic uh more, there will be hundreds of people who will be leaving and traveling around the world so looking at this outlook of tourism especially looking at this uh this trade that is uh, estimated as at about 28.7 billion dollars coming to the african continent we are grateful tonight to have a, a, a awesome discussion with two awesome gentlemen uh who have an extensive uh, interest in travels both in liberia and nigeria and the west african continent our first guest is uh, uh, mr pillow i will face so he is a winner is a he's a 2010 CNN multi choice journalist of the year in the area of tourism reporting. And in late 2019, he was named as the best travel journalist in the Republic of Nigeria by the Nigerian Travel Week. He has keen interest in promoting local and international awareness of Nigerian arts, Nigerian culture, and traditional architecture, among other assets, especially as they relate to the impact on domestic, domestic tourism. Uh, he has written several books on this topic. And he has appeared on Sunny Mirror, Lonely Planet. Uh, some of the books he has traveled, he has written is Nigerian Festival, The Tour of Duty, White Lagos, Nigeria Degrees to Nuff. And he has edited an anthology of global travel uh, writing, Route 234. And I show Route 234, we'll talk about it later. It looks to me as the international postal code for Nigeria. So, uh, and then we also have Mr. Lekpele M. Yamalon. He is an award-winning poet and uh, poetry fellow of the Open Society Initiative of West Africa, OSIWA. He is also the Mandela Washington Fellowship, uh, fellow, fellowship recipient. He's a fellow of that institution. And he has deep interest in the fight for injustice. He, his cap book, Yarnings of a Traveler, explores themes around migration, span Africanism, gender, identity, war, and co colonialism. He, he is a telecommunication and marketing professional, and he has more than a decade experience in the telecommunication industry. So ladies and gentlemen, helping as we welcome my two awesome guests, Mr. Yapona is also the founder of Africa's Life. So let us re, uh, welcome Mr. Lekpele, uh, Yamano, and Mr. Peliu Awofiso. Uh, welcome gentlemen, how are you guys doing this evening? Thank you very much, Emmanuel. Thank you, Mr. Gopin. Thank, Thank you so much. It's good to be on the program, and uh, thanks for having me on the program. I appreciate it. Welcome, gentlemen. Welcome to the broadcast. And I am excited to have you. My pleasure. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Okay, so let's start ball rolling. Uh, how do you guys feel about your industry in 2023? What what is happening? What's the big thing happening in the US in, industry in West Africa, in Liberia, in Nigeria? I know Pelu, you currently in. Uh, you told me you in Porto Novo, that is in uh, the Republic of Benin. Uh, so, what what is your projection? What what are you guys projecting for the tourism in, in industry in 2023? Okay, please allow me to. Um say that it's really glad um, I'm really glad to be on the program like I said earlier I'm so honored to have this opportunity to talk about Africa you know African tourism and the potential the possibilities you know the things we need to be thinking about and but before I go into my my, my thoughts I'd like to um, um, crave your indulgence in advance because I'm in Porto Novo like you said I'm depending on the local internet you know, I've had to top it up a little bit, but I'm not sure how long it's going to, it's going to last. I've tried to put as much money on it as possible. So if for any reason I cut off this on the standard, the data is what I, is responsible. So um, without much ado, let me just quickly do this. Mm -hmm. I'm so happy to have been able to visit Porto Novo, you know, as a Nigerian. And I feel very ashamed that I'm coming to Porto Novo for the very first time in my life, you know, at this stage, Porto Novo, Benin, West Africa is, I mean, I, I mean, it's a region that I should have explored extensively long before now. But the problem is that we are so, we are so locked into our respective countries that we have failed to see the potentials and the opportunities and the uniqueness of West Africa in the scheme of things. 
and Nigerians remain in Nigeria and they go to the West. They go everywhere else but West Africa. But other West Africans stay in their countries. They go to the West. They go to Europe. They go to the US. They go to Dubai right now, the rape of the moment. We don't think at all about our own region. Mm -hmm. And we are the ones who are supporting the international tourism to make so much money. Emmanuel, you quoted so many, a lot of impressive figures, you know, about the international trade and international travel and tourism. Africa makes a tiny percentage of international global receipts. It's a shame for a continent of more than 1 billion people to be funding the growth and development of tourism in a different part of the world. And what we have here are suffering. Like you said, I'm in Porto Novo. Porto Novo is rich in culture and heritage and history. I've been here for two days. I was blown away by all of the things that I've seen in two days. You know, the international community is here enjoying the African heritage, enjoying the Voodoo Festival. I took a day tour around here today. I've been shown ancient culture, ancient heritage, ancient spirituality. They blew my mind away. And I'm wondering why am I seeing all this now in my fifth decade in life? Why was I not informed about all of these things when I was in my 20s and my 30s? Why does it have to take me coming on my own at this stage to explore and see Koso, um, to see Porto Novo and not earlier? And then I can say the same thing. I've been to Ghana three to four times. I'm blown away by all the things that I've seen in Ghana as a Nigerian, and I wish to share that information with the rest of the world. And my, my agenda right now is to focus more on projecting West African tourism because I'm West African. Charity, they say, begins at home. I want to begin to showcase the, the, the beauty and the heritage and the culture of Africa. The world is paying attention now to Africa. Everybody is trying to do business with Africa. I hope our government, I hope our president, I hope our prime ministers will wake up to see that we have done a disservice to Africa by allowing the rest of the world to paint Africa in a very negative light and under, under selling us, under valuing us, under, under I mean, demarketing Africa as we were when we know all of the riches that we have. For 2023, I see African tourism growing because it appears as if the interest is now on the continent. West Africa is going to take a large section of the tourism pie. But again, whatever we gain in 2023, as hopeful as I am, is not going to be anything compared to the potentials that we have in the region, not to even talk about Africa as a whole. I mean, let me just say, with that for now and allow my colleague, you know, to also say a bit. But I mean, that, that's, I mean, I feel so very angry. I feel so like we have done a terrible deed to Africa, to West Africa, the black African region. I mean, the, um, the, 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 the Western coast of Africa has so much to offer the international community. But it appears as if our governments are just not awake to all of these responsibilities and they leave that to someone like, but I'm so sorry, I have to use my to so call your name. They leave that to somebody like my friend Le Pele and, I mean, and all of our colleagues to do all of this. We are not government officials for God's sake. Government is supposed to provide an enabling environment for all of this to happen. Why do we have to be the ones setting our continent by ourselves with our own resources, without any sort of government or structured support? It's not the same way elsewhere in the world. For every country that has grown their tourism, they've had a lot of governmental support, a lot of government backing, creating the environment for all of those things to thrive. Of course, government has to prepare and provide the infrastructure for these things to grow. You really need to get a sense of what is possible when you come to a small, I mean, you come to a Porto Novo, you come to Wida, you go to Cotonou, you go to Accra, you know, you go to Lome, you go to, I mean, you go to all of these places, the potentials are there, there's no doubt about it. But what are we doing with the potentials? How are we setting this into West Africans? Before we even begin to invite the rest of the world, we need to impress our own people about our own culture, about our own wealth, before they, before, I mean, because we also need them as ambassadors to the rest of the world. But if you continue to have Africans think terribly about Africans, if every African that you know wants to go and relocate abroad, then we are in deep trouble. And that is untenable for a, for, for a sub-region that is so rich, that is so wealthy in heritage and history, for all of our best brains to be leaving the continent in their thousands. It's unfortunate. And I really wish we could just reverse all of that trend. Uh, I mean, I'm so sorry. Uh, these are things that I think so pain that what is going on on the continent. These are great points you are making, Pelu. I'm sure we're going to we'll pick it back on it. So, Lepele, why you, why your outlook? Why are you thinking about tourism? What's your outlook of tourism in West Africa, especially where you are in Liberia? Uh, thanks, so, uh, uh, Dr. George and uh, Mr. Sharif. I I'd like to begin by agreeing with Pelu 
especially <laughs> on the point of exploring Africa on a late timetable. Uh, you know, recently I was uh, in three different African countries for the Christmas uh, holidays in Lomé and the and I can say for a fact that Africa has a lot to offer, beginning with uh, government's intention. Government has to be very intentional about tourism and to see the industry as a, a major point that needs investment. Tourism doesn't have to come as an afterthought that people are just using it for leisure or exploration. But government has to see it as a major area for investment. So government has to be intentional. As, as much as African governments are trying to attract uh, foreign direct investment, they have to see tourism as, not as a low hanging fruit per se, but as an industry that sits right in front of us. I will give Ghana as an example. Ghana would do very well in investing heavily in tourism. Ghana was able to attract a lot of uh, people from the black diaspora to come to Ghana and buy homes and invest. And, and recently through the music industry, the Ghana hosted the Afrochella. And a lot of Africans from uh, the black diaspora and around the world came to Ghana. And, and besides the Afrochella concert that was held in Accra, they were able to explore the food, the culture, the people. And you can imagine the uh, trickle down economic effect that that event had on Ghana. And a few years ago in 20, uh -huh. I think it was 2019 or 2020 day about when Ghana was at a year of return that attracted a lot of buy homes and learning about trade. In, in, I would like to take a step further inward even in our own countries, as Africans, we should be able to explore our own countries, to go and visit areas intentionally. Uh, before I went on the Christmas holidays, I went to a magnificent waterfall in Liberia called the Patawi Waterfalls. And <laughs> it's a shame that uh, I'm from Bong going to Patawi was my first time. And I, I, I believe that Patawi has been heavily honorated and has never been sold as a, an experience for hiking, sunset hiking, and early sunrise hike. It has uh, all the features of, like, our in Ghana, and the waterfalls they have now, uh, I think it's the Iburi Falls, because they're in the dry season, the, uh, the falls, the water pressure has gone low. But right back though in Liberia, the fall is constant. So we can be able to mimic the same experiences that people have in the Caribbean and other parts of the tourist hotspots around the world. So African, for some reason, I don't understand why African governments who, whose leaders have been exposed to the larger part of the world and have seen what tourism, oh. what effects tourism has been able to give to those countries. Because there are many sectors that are triggered by tourism. The hospitality industry, for example, uh, the airline industry, the food industry, and your locals who your culture gets exploited. <laughs> and uh, a pillow, but maybe the post a little bit about Liberia. Liberia is, <laughs> is, 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 is positioned so rightly in terms of its history. Uh, Liberia has the potential to attract the entire Black diaspora because this is a land that every Black man saw as a place to call home. So in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 60s, Liberia attracted schools of, of Pan-Africanists or African freedom fighters. I mean, uh, your president, Namdi Azikiwe, he went through Liberia at some point and many other African greats went through this country. So Liberia is not just a home for Liberians, but for members of, for, for every black person seeking freedom everywhere came to this land and called it home. So, and these stories, are, you can see the same about country like Nigeria in many in different respects, about Ghana in different respects. Yeah. So we all have our unique histories that we can see up and attract Africans within the continent to explore Africa first. Because if we, and I, I would say we'll begin with our own countries, to explore our countries first and extend our exploration to Africa 
And then over time, we'll be able to attract the greater part of the of the uh, the global population. Just to close on this note as my introductory point, China, for example, due to its size, uh, you know, the Chinese government had this COVID restriction on uh, Chinese, so they could not travel out for a long period of time. And that greatly affected the yeah. tourism industry in many countries. So if we're able to uh, build our industry and attract the Chinese because of their size and population, we have a great potential to, even in terms of, uh, of, of investment, tell the Chinese that, look, we have tourism potentials. I know China is, in, is heavily interested in Africa at this point for natural resources. So it's a very good selling point to attract more, more, uh, most Chinese to come to Africa and explore our tourism potential and enjoy themselves in Africa, why China is also looking for ways to connect with the African continent. I, I think it's, it's a fruit that African governments should be more visionary in this, in, in this approach. All right, gentlemen, thank you so much, Pelu, and thank you, Lepile, for being here with us. Um, I'd like to go back to Pelu, let me just come to you for a second. You said something very important in your opening remarks when you talk about putting Africa first and maybe Africans selling Africa to, to ourselves. You know, I just yeah. like to go back on this point. You know, uh, most of our dignitaries in Africa, when it's, when it's time for vacations, they don't go to the villages to visit. They don't go to, you know, any parts of their country to spend that vacation. You know, they would take those trips abroad. They would go to places yeah. and they would take countless resources with them. So, you know, uh, with that point being said, though, how can the grassroots level individuals like yourself, like my brother, like Billy, how can the grassroots level actually work to make or to allow our people to see that, look, you can take your vacation and just go to Inugu State and relax. You don't have to go to London. You know, how can we make Africa appealing to the, to the people? Oh, well, so, I mean, um, thank you very much for, for that um, observation and the question. I'll just answer this question by giving you a very clear, real-life example of what actually happened in Nigeria, and maybe in the, in the early 2000s. That was when we had President Obasanjo as the president of Nigeria. He came into office in 1999, and the same year he introduced a stand-alone Ministry of Tourism, Arts, and Culture. Nigeria never had a standalone ministry, you know, in charge of tourism. And so mm -hmm. what he did was, in partnership with the state government, well, let, let me just say this. So he began to promote tourism domestically in Nigeria. So back down south in Cross River State, the governor was also very allowed, I mean, was very alive to the potentials of tourism. And he made his state, especially Calabar, you know, a tourism destination. It, had, it has never happened before in the history of Nigeria that in a single month, in December to be specific, a million Nigerians would travel from all over the country to that small capital called Calabar. And they made everything. So this is a clear example of the government playing its role in making domestic tourism a major aspect of the people's lives. The government initiated all sorts of programs that ensured that Nigerians, Nigerians, found Calabar very attractive in the one in the entire one month of December. We've never had it before. A million people would travel to get into Calabar. The population of Calabar, I don't think, is more than a, about two million. So imagine having 50% of that population storm that state in one month, you know, and enjoy and climax with the carnival. The president himself, because of that, had a partnership with the state government to say, you know what, go up north in Cross River and build up a resort and they built a Calabar, I mean, um, a, um, a, a ranch resort in the north of the carnival, I mean, the, of, of that state. And then President Obasanjo, instead of going abroad for like a retreat or for like a vacation, he would travel from Abuja and head all the way to Cross River and go up north to take a vacation. It is leaders setting an example by doing, not by saying. After President Obasanjo left office, Every other, every other president that took over from him never visited that ranch resort. It was purposely built for the president of Nigeria. So that's a clear example of how 
a president of a country, the leader of a country can lead by example. If you lead by example, everybody will see your body language. All the governors, all the mayors, all the heads of the different regions or the different states, as we call them in Nigeria, once they see the president holidaying in the country, within the country, they dare not take the people's money outside to go and spend it on vacation in the West or in Dubai or in anywhere else. You do your vacation in the country like I am doing as the president of the country, and then everybody will feel a sense of trust and security to say, look, our country is beautiful enough. Take a vacation, our president is doing it. The governors are doing it. The ministers are doing it. We as the people too can do it. Unfortunately, right now, Nigerians can't even feel the same sense of security and the same, the same sense of belonging to take those vacations because the president goes abroad for everything. All the governors go abroad for everything. The people will not be encouraged to do the same thing. So we have actually gone several steps back from what the president in the, in the early 2000s was trying to achieve to grow domestic tourism. So the ball still lies in the court of the leaders. If the leaders can show example by doing these things locally, uh, people are going to take after them and celebrate their country, be proud of their own country, and take those vacations, invest their resources in their own society, and not take it out the way we are seeing at the moment. It's very sad what is going on in Africa. It's unfortunate, it's saddening, it's depressing, and I still put the blame on the government. Okay, but yet I'm still, I mean, I agree that there's challenges with the government, I agree that there's challenges with a lot of stuff, uh, but yet I'm still, um, there's an estimated income, let's take for like, the estimated income for West Africa, for Af West Africa of about $26.7 billion in tourism for the year, for, the, for 2023. So th there, 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 there's a lot of interest within travels. In fact, uh, as I read some of the travel analysis, global travel analysis, the people are looking for unique places to visit, the one unique experience uh, uh, that they can visit right now. So. For the next few minutes, because you guys have a lot of information, so we don't want—I don't—we don't want to lose it. But what are the tourist potential? If uh, if I want to come on a vacation right now to West Africa, what are some of the places that, uh, like Pele, you say, okay, if you come to this particular place, you're going to have fun. You're going to be able to do this. Are there places in in your part of the of the world that 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 you will be that you can tell our viewers tonight? Now look, if you have money, don't go to don't don't, don't go to California. You have money, don't go to Disney World this year. Come to this particular place. You're going to get a, an experience that is far better and more interesting than Disney. Do you guys have places like that in Africa you want to talk about? So like, I, I, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, can I go now? Yes, go ahead. Oh, yes, please. I, I think you should. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I would say absolutely, uh, because I'll take Liberia for example. One of the things that is happening around now is that the Black diaspora wants to connect with Africa so deeply. And that's a huge market potential that we have to take a of. There are many Black people who are trying to do DNA tests to authenticate where they are from originally in Africa. So uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, if you have Liberia, for example, as a country that hosted uh, a lot of freed slaves who came back home and the former country. So that, that history is rich by itself. So there are towns in, in Monserrado County, in Sano County, in many parts of Liberia that connect people directly with the black diaspora. So you want to first of all leverage on that history to connect people that you can come back home and find ancestors you can connect family ties with people who, who were or who were uh, enslaved abroad and came back home and settled. So people from the Barbados, for example, from the, uh, the Caribbean, these people have actual family lineages in Liberia that you can connect. So we have an opportunity to build a Pan-African Museum, for example, that will give you rich storytelling and connect people who families where it works from here to uh, the, across the Atlantic and came back home and formed a country. Even if there's no direct, there's no direct link, but the history is still strong and it connects many Africans or members of the black diaspora. So I think 
we should first start with our history. We have a very rich history to connect Black people from everywhere and to be able to bring them here. Now, in terms of the our geography, we have like more than seven counties along the coast in Liberia. And there, there are opportunities for resorts. Uh, we have rivers. We have physical features that can provide the same sort of relief that you have in the Caribbean or anywhere else that has that tourism potential. And there's a Sapo National Park in Liberia. I was in Abidjan. I went to a park called uh, Bango National Park. And, and I was just thinking about Sapo Park. And domestic tourism is a great potential because it makes it easier for citizens to market the potential that that country has. And many of us are not able to market our domestic tourism potential because we have not been to these places. We've not seen these places. And uh, to agree with Pelo, our governments have not prioritized tourism as a sector that needs deliberate investment. So uh, if we begin to see these places and market them, then we can begin to attract people. I'll fall back again on Patawi. I think it's an experience that to all of you on this panel, if you've never been to uh, Patawi waterfalls, please visit Patawi. It's an experience you want to have because uh, just the, the site of the fall alone and the, just the geography of the area, it gives you uh, a serene environment that you may just want to explore. And then the question comes to mind, what are all other things that can be done around this place? Can we build uh, a, a resort? What can we do around this place that will make more people to come here? Now, go to Nima County, for example. There's the Yekepa or Nima Range. And if you were to see the picture of that range, it looks no different from the pyramid in Egypt. The same design you see. So, and these are great potentials that I would say, come to Liberia and see. If you want to see something that looks like the pyramid in Egypt, come to Liberia and you can see something. And there are many examples. Um, take our, uh, our oceans and waterways. Now, for those who are professional surfers, to tell you that the waters in Liberia are very ideal for serving. So many people come to this country and pay almost nothing and they go to surf. This is a great opportunity that uh, our governments can take advantage of to attract, make sure they own problems to have, we can have them. And I also believe that in the spirit of African cooperation and unity, uh, let's start with ECOWAS. When we begin to, to do cross-border tourism, it's one of the fastest ways that we can integrate Anglophone Africa versus Francophone oh. Africa, visiting the different countries. We can have a strong cooperation once we begin to visit and learn about each other, our culture, our people, and our practices. All these things can happen. Personally, when I visit oh. a country, I, I try to see what is the artistic infrastructure in that country. So I go to the museum to get a feel of the history of the people, the culture, and then try a look of food uh, and probably see what's happening there. So through the food, you get to understand the history of the people and you know, the culture. I often say this, that a nation that respects us and culture is a country that is deeply in tune with a soul because the soul of a people are stored in the arts and culture. And this is a very great potential that we can begin to harness and uh, ensure that the resources that we're seeking out there on the ground in gold and diamond, tourism is, is the one of the fastest and uh, the lowest hanging fruit, so to speak, that we can go to and experience and make sure that as a people, as a continent, we're able to attract the red people. So to go back to that question, I think, to begin with, the history. Our history is so rich. And we can use that as a selling point to attract mainly the black diaspora and a lot of people can follow. Yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Mr. Lepele. And I think uh, there's a video here of the waterfall that we can try to upload. Uh, I'm gonna try if, just in case, I mean, those of you who are watching, if for some reason you don't see faces, just know we're just trying to see if that video uploads. But I mean, this is- This is by the wee waterfall. And this is the origin of the Badawi waterfalls. I'm here in Bon County. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing experience. Can you see this? <laughs> oh my goodness. 
God is so wonderful, God is so, and God is beautiful, God is all powerful. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this blessing. Thank you. Amen. So, you, as I, as, sorry. As I listen to you, you know, I can hear the excitement in your voice, right? I think that video was uploaded by you, Mr. Uh, Victor. But, you know, as a Liberian myself, <laughs> I am ashamed to say I have not been to the location. <laughs> You know, and, you know, it's one of those things that for some reason, though, you get to your little corner and you sit there and you get very comfortable in your little corner. You know, uh, I always tell people if for some reason you had to take me to Grand Bassa County, I would get I'll probably get you lost in Buchanan and part of Grand Bassa County, not just Buchanan, but Grand Bassa as a whole. I would lost you there. You bring me to Monrovia, I will do my best. You will probably beat me because I, that war brought me to Monrovia. But you know, other places, there are a lot of prominent places. I would just say this story. You know, I was going to Washington, DC to visit, and on my flight, it was full of students. This was during the summer break. And these kids were being transported to the nation's capital so they can visit those things that they read about in history books. And you know, the reason I bring that up is I don't think our school systems or even the government or even Let's just put the education system, even the tourism system. They don't do much to promote those places. And right now, I can definitely say maybe tourism is going to, some of these places are becoming well-known because of social media. You got people that actually go up there and they do these videos. Influencers go and they do these videos for the tourism department. And, and that is how these things are coming out. But when we were kids, man, these things were never made popular. So what is your organization doing or what is organization similar to yours doing to make sure that the next generation of Sharif and everybody else know what we have in our backyard? Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, thanks for that. I, I, I think that uh, as a beginning point, as a traveler, like what I did with Father Weed, like, as you saw, is everywhere I go, I try to, you know, <laughs> Let me just come back a little bit. Most times when we travel outside Liberia or outside our own country, that's when we want to market and say, oh, I was in this country, I was in this place. And for some of these things I, I write back here. So when I travel, for example, and they say, oh, there's a beach nearby, I'm not excited to go on a beach in any country because I think we, we have some of the best beaches in the world. And, and so that's why I try to market those beaches. You mentioned Bikina, for example. You go to Sunset Beach. And you see the the natural growth of coconut trees along that beach, and just the, the natural in terms of its geography, the natural beauty of Sunset Beach, and other beaches you find uh, in, in Montserrat County, like Caesar's Beach, which is now called Scarlet, and then there's an echo lodge called Libasa, and so forth. So personally, I, I make it a, a duty to to market what I see within Liberia. What are the potentials we have? People talk about hiking. If you cannot go on a mountain hike, why can't you take a hike and run a waterfall? It's a one hour, 30 minute hike to, uh, to go and come combined. So a bit beyond the waterfall video I did, I tried to do a video on the hiking experience, on the food they serve there, and on the waterfall itself, and then on the history of Padawi, what it meant to people who lived there before it began to, to, to um, what it is now. So as a personal traveler, uh, there are things I, 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 I can do in my capacity. There are other things I've, uh, I've planned to do uh, with what are we in other natural areas across the country. So as to showcase what we have, because this is one of the ways to sort of promote our country and our people. Of course, there, 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 there are challenges I would like to highlight as well. And it has to do with infrastructure, the road connectivity, to go to the these places. Take Maryland, for example, uh, with its potential for uh, for tourism. The beaches are great. The history is excellent. As a country that joined Liberia, as, as a Commonwealth country that joined Liberia somewhere around, uh, I, I think, uh, in the 1800s, the history is rich. But how do people go to Maryland? So we have to be able to look at the infrastructure that tends to facilitate tourism. So. Uh, government should be able to 
invest in infrastructure. Even the part that we, there's a challenge with the road. Uh, so they have to also focus on that because it makes it easier to have more traffic going to those places if we can we can invest in our transport infrastructure. And across West Africa as well. So as to be able to drive from Liberia to Africa Coast without needing to fly or to sailing or to Guinea. Now, people who are going to Guinea from Liberia have to go through Sierra Leone. That's bizarre. We should be able to just drive through to Guinea without having to pass through another country. Why is that happening? Because the road connectivity is terrible. So these are things that we, we governments have to fix as we move along the tourism route. And then before we can take a, a break, I within West Africa too, there's something around immigration that has to be settled. There's language barrier areas, but immigration officers should be educated that you have tourists moving around. So there's so much harassment at border points. And these things have to be corrected as well. That as ECOWAS citizens with an ECOWAS passport, we should be able to travel freely. So African governments who are promoting trade and free movement have to emphasize that free movement is not only about uh, traveling by air, but importantly by road, because it is one of the easiest ways to be able to commute within the West African region and beyond. Um, okay, that's awesome. We will take a uh, one minute break and come back and then we take closing. I think Pelu is off uh, uh, because of he's in a foreign country and adapting to <laughs> to, to internet in, in, in Francophone West Africa. But we'll take a break and then we'll be back. Thank you so much. waterfalls and this is the origin of the Badawi waterfalls. I'm here in Bonn County. Uh, it's an amazing, amazing experience. Can you see this? <laughs> oh my goodness. God is so wonderful. God is so, um, God is beautiful. God is all powerful. Thank you Heavenly Father for this blessing. Thank you. Amen. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. Um, I feel like it's good you're back. I mean, Sherry was get, was saying something, so I'll just say, uh, because Sherry is far younger than I am. So I would say, I remember when I was in high school at Conola, if we in our history class, we had we had uh, field trips. And it was during that time that I first I discovered certain things in Liberia. We, I remember one year we visited where the, the, the where uh what was it the constitution or was where was written or where the flag in clay ashland there was an old church in clay ashland we visited um uh the girls school uh say bromley i hope i'm getting it right bromley on the st paul river we followed the route of the settlers when they came to liberia we went up to to what the place name we went up to uh you know capitol hill the other one uh is it snapple hill no snap the other side one of those that hill you guys hill, yeah. I'm going here, right up the hill where we have mm -hmm. where you stay and, yeah and, and and that's what got me interested in history uh or actually and and trips oh. because i could literally see uh at this old church i don't know if it's still there in clay ashland because the time we visited and that was in 19 it was in the 80s so that was a long time ago and the time we visited visited in the 80s at that time with my class um the church they had a big pantry that have that fell on it they were trying to renovate it at that time so i'm not too sure what is that church is still there in clay, clay ashland so we we have my question is that and i think we have three minutes to wrap up but my question is um in your experience with your uh, agriculture teaching that you that you do in Liberia, 
uh, do you think that uh, the teachers of history, social studies, are incorporating this practical aspect? And Pelu is here too, so I will take that as you guys closing something. Uh, Pelu, welcome back. So my question- Thank you very much. Okay. Are we adapting that into, into, our, into, our, into our learning process? Do we allow our students to look at this practical? Because, you know, not to take so much of your time, the reason I'm interested, before we came on the show, yeah, I was discussing, we're sharing some ideas, some things that we're thinking about working out. And I will be in Liberia too, so may I meet with you, because I'm, I'm strongly thinking about that too for Liberia. Uh, my company before, before the pandemic uh, that I consulted with, uh, we ran field trips, we ran over, ran over 200 field trips a year. Uh, oh. Just before the pandemic, we were running 240 to 260 field trips. Uh, that's I mean 260 different schools in just the in the Dallas Fort Worth area. And sometimes we went overnight to Houston to pick students from Houston and bring them bring them to to the capital. And it was part of the course. We didn't even we just we didn't just take students on trips. We had to go into what we call uh, the syllabus in Texas. It's called the Texas Essential Knowledge. So we had to go into the Texas Essential Knowledge, pick up uh, uh, the objective for the trips. And then teach the students as we go along, sometimes eight hours a day. We are teaching as we go going through that eight hours of, of programming. So not to, to take so much time, because I'm, I'm running that, and Sherry and I will come and talk in 10 minutes <laughs> back and forth on this. But do we have this incorporated in our syllabus in Liberia? Our history teachers implementing these practical field trips. Are we working towards helping them to, to practicalize uh, uh, or, or this knowledge because it starts with the kids. Once the state kids start getting excited about it, by the time we grow in the last 10, 20 years, we have people being excited to go to various spot, part, 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 part of, of the country. So let me start okay, with if you don't, if, Yeah. If you don't mind, let me just jump in right now because I'm not sure how much data that I have. Okay. Um, I'm just borrowing data now. So quickly, mm -hmm. um, it's so impressive what you just described about all the school trips. Um, someone has said in Nigeria that the older generation of Nigerians or maybe of Africans have missed out on the tourism, um, on, on tourism basically. We now need to focus on the younger generation of Africans, more or less, or even younger, younger generation of Nigerians. And to be fair to the schools, they actually have um, trips planned for their students and their pupils maybe once in a time. And in the, in the primary school and secondary school, we have three, three terms, and so they, they, they do one trip per term. Um, while you were here in Nigeria, you talked about trips in, at the Bab Babcock University. So I think, to a large extent, schools are beginning to realize the importance of all of these practical experiences for, for students, and they are already doing it. You know? And I think it's something um, what's encouraging. You know, if, if we can do more of that, it then means that, and of course, well, they take, from, they take their students around Lagos, around Nigeria. Some even go beyond and take them to Ghana. Ghana is the most popular destination for schools in Nigeria. So that's a very, a very positive move by schools. We don't, we don't, what, what we now need to build on is to encourage them to go beyond Ghana, to go to other African countries. And the issue that Nekwele uh, raised about Francophone and Anglophone African with uh, Africa, we need to really bridge that, that, that divide. Because I'm here in Otonobo and I can't speak French. I can't speak phone. I can't even, I can't even, I can't even have everyday conversation. I'm handicapped in that respect. So in addition to taking those trips, it will be important for schools to begin to teach um, students in schools French and English. So they are bilingual in those international languages and they can communicate. So if they bring them to Ghana or they bring them to Togo or, 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 or or Benin Republic or Senegal, they will be able to have conversation with their own generation. So we don't build, we don't grow, we don't develop the future generation of Africans on just one language. In Anglophone Africa, they learn English. In Francophone Africa, they learn French. We need to teach them two languages. So that's what I would say in response to what you said. Just to piggyback on the last question before I was thrown up by data, the fellow was um, talking about the beauties of the continent. In addition to um, the, the things you already talked about, I just want to add that West Africa is the hub of culture. In Nigeria, we have hundreds of festivals every year. West Africa is very rich in culture. 
Western festivals are a major part of that culture. I already know that Western travelers are interested in the culture and the festivals of Africa. They are interested in all of that unspoiled um, um, nature and then the culture, and they're coming. Already I have, I have people talk to me about coming to Nigeria, and we're already preparing for their visit in March, in April, in June. They are interested, on, they are interested in that pure, undiluted way of life of our people. That tells you exactly what the future is going to be about. People are tired of all other destinations. Africa is the future of global tourism. The signs are already there. We just need to wake up to see that Africa is now the darling of the rest of the world. And uh, let me just stop there for now and let the fellow uh, say so be. There's so much going on. There's so much going on. We are not seeing the results here, but it's going to be, they're all going to manifest in the next decade and we have to be prepared for it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, thank you so much for for that note you know i was <laughs> I, I was i was in abuja recently and uh my, my old friends came back <laughs> to use <laughs> i i got left in the court of as a refugee so uh i, I was able to manage with it <laughs> to get back with our friends but an important point about connecting africa because in 2015 i was in senegal uh, on gory island as a port in residence and we had francophone Africans uh, ports who, and then we have uh, we had anglophone ports, and of, there was always we always had two sections when we went through the workshop because of the language barrier. So I think, especially for anglophone countries, I think the francophone countries have a language program. So most of them speak some level of of most of them have a second of a second language, out of mm. or it's Spanish or it's, or it's French or it's, or it's English. I think from a Francophone perspective, our curriculum has to include French from the elementary level. So, for example, if you're teaching French at the first grade level, by the time a student graduates from high school, if they're learning French in first grade, seventh grade, third grade, the same level at which they will know English as a high school graduate to potentially know French at that same level. Unfortunately, yeah, we start teaching French, elementary French, so very, I was in university and doing French that I did in in uh, sixth grade when I was in Africa. So I was breaching through uh, university French because it was very elementary for my level at the time. So I think we need to teach French alongside English, like first grade English, first yeah. grade French, and like, like that. So I think by the time yeah. you finish high school, you have a certain level of proficiency in the language. And uh, for the speech trips, not to cut you guys. Language yeah. thing, right? not to cut you guys with your language thing, but let me just drop this in this as you guys answer. And then, um, be Mr. Sherry, because he asked that Mr. Sherry have been kind to give us more time. But let me drop this in there the language thing you're speaking. I mean, you guys have traveled West Africa, I, I traveled West Africa intensively, uh, as a young man. And I don't know, Pelu, you two, you're moving around that area. There is a very, if you travel West Africa between Nigeria and Ghana, there's almost a 24 hours movement. But within that movement, one thing I noticed from mm. Nigeria all the way to Liberia, one thing I noticed, it's not French, it's not English. The primary language of travel that I noticed Pick while traveling in Africa is Hausa, <laughs> Mandingo. Uh, so, I mean, mm. I don't know if you guys observed that, but I, uh, even most of the borders, the Hausa or Mandingo, as we call it, like well, I think in Cote d'Ivoire, they, they have different names in Cote d'Ivoire, we call them. But m many of them don't travel with passports. Yeah, do it's, they travel with that language. They just speak the language at the border. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, Very interesting you know, point. You know, I was telling my friend, we are promoting English, but I have observed, and the, the two of you have traveled extensively. So, Sherry, if the older young man here that would try to show us, I'm to the court. Have you guys observed that too? So, sorry, I just failed to put it that in there. <laughs> well, I, I haven't. I'm even surprised. Point. I, was, I was telling my yeah. Okay, please, 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 please carry on. Carry on. I'll, I'll come after you. Okay, yeah, I was just saying a very interesting point. I, I was telling my friend the other time that uh, if I wanted to learn another Liberian language apart from my native language, I would learn Mandingo because of its mm. connection in West Africa. 
they, they are because the Madingos are in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, they call it, I think, Jula. They oh, in, yeah, they uh, yes. They're in uh, Niger. You you find them in, in Guinea, of course, in Mali. And Nigeria, of course, the Hausa and, and the Madingos, they understand each other somehow. So, and then culturally, you'll be able to connect easily if you can speak Madingo, West Africa will be, yes. I mean, we, I mean, we'll miss out on that. We'll focus more on English. Uh, I think it's the, the one of the effects of colonization, <laughs> the language aspect. But <laughs> but I think so, yes. You know, there are West African languages that are very popular that we also need to look at in terms of popular, uh, in terms of travel and convenience. Yeah, so I think to look and coming on that and I'll, I'll come back home I, I, I still i was still trying to, to get my point on a few trip so okay uh, fine um <laughs> let me give okay quickly let me just say i'm not sure it, thank you very much but i mean if you ask me i'll say maybe pidgin you know is a language of west africa you know i'm not sure about the madingo and the Aosa. yeah we have Aosa in nigeria in, in in the northern part of the country um, I was in, I've been in Ghana three times. I was there in October last year, and I traveled extensively, you know, from the south of the country to the north. I know that there is also outer speaking part of Ghana, and I also, I mean, so um, in the in in the in the in my own travels, I haven't seen the dominance of those two languages I to talk about. Mm. But I think that what I'll say is the unite, uh, unifying language is Pidgin, even though we speak Pidgin differently. We are able to kind of figure it out, you know. When I listen to Ghanaian pidgin, they use a set of different words to what we use in Nigeria, but I'm still able to understand what they say. You know, I haven't been in Senegal, I haven't been in Cote d'Ivoire, I haven't been in Liberia, unfortunately. So I may not be aware of the influence and the dominance of Madinga and Aousa. Of course, I look forward to experiencing all of this, maybe like um, confirming what you are saying. It is also the unfortunate thing. We haven't traveled extensively enough to even be able to identify that these are the realities of our lives in West Africa. You know, unfortunately, ECOWAS is not even playing its own part in ensuring that um, language-wise. You know, it has failed woefully. The African Union has also failed woefully. I don't know what institution of government, what institution of state, is actually, you know, you know, um, serving the continent effectively because it, it just seems like everybody is just doing their own thing. Af um, each country in their own world, and they're just dividing you and I. They're dividing all of us along different lines, and it's just unfortunate. But again, we try to find a way, you know, to navigate the sub region, and I hope that the future leaders of this continent will see all those loopholes, will see all those lapses and all those um, broken bridges and try to mend them. I think the older generation of leaders have failed Africa. Um, so they, we need to begin to look at it. Peru, so, help me test my hypothesis, right? The next time you travel, after your, your long trip, uh, share with me, when you change money, the money changes in all these countries, which language are they speaking? Speaking. <laughs> so, so, uh, I mean, I, I, look forward, I look forward to that experience, actually. I really look forward to it. It's, it's, it's news to me, and as a yeah. journalist, I'm always interested in those new things. And those are the things I'm going to be focusing on. For example, I'm observing the new things that I'm experiencing in Porto Novo. And that's going to go into my, my writing eventually. And then I'll be able to, of course, share that information with other people who may want to travel in this area. So if I experience that in my future trips, you know, in that area, I'll definitely document it. That's what I do when I travel. I, I document experiences. And so, it's also a way to learn. So, Pelo, before you leave, I, I know you have to go. I know uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Liquid wants to also talk about his field trip. But before you go, I just, ha I just have to point out this thing. You know, I live in a state in the state of Colorado, and every year we have this event in my state called Global Fest. And Global Fest in my city is actually dedicated to all of the communities in that particular uh, in the city. They will come and they will meet at this place. Every culture will be on display. So this year was beautiful. Nigeria was on display. You have uh, Liberia. You have all of these different cultures, and people wear their traditional tunics, and people are actually showcasing, showcasing their cultures. And the reason that is super important, you know, um, I show up to this fest, 
And <laughs> there were there were Caucasians who were wearing the African tunics, you know, wearing the African clothes. And here they I love it. And here I show up, I'm wearing a European attire, right? Uh -huh. right? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, and, and so I guess I, I say that example to ask you guys, you in, your in, in your experience, do you think us African, we really appreciate what we have? Or, I mean, do we not see what we have? Do we really love our culture to the point that we will be boldly going to these events with our traditional outfits? Okay, I'll quickly answer that and I'll let the politic um, give a go at it. So, I think it's the educated Africans who are so into their Western affinities. We love to be, we love to look Western because we've been educated in the Western, we've been educated in the way of the West. So we mm -hmm. feel that to keep up with that education, we need to look fly, we need to look Western, we need to look polished. And we think that, well, what is our own, you know, indigenous dressing, you know, are not suitable for certain, you know, um, workplace scenarios. But again, we still appreciate our clothes a little bit. I know in Nigeria, for example, when we go for parties and we go for functions, we wear the native dress, the way we call it. But in office settings, in, in gatherings, um, in social gatherings that don't involve family and friends, we'd like to turn up in suit and shirt and tie, okay? Now, the beautiful thing that I've noticed here in Porto Novo is that a large majority of the population are so happily dressed in their traditional dress. It's African wax fabric. And I've seen lots and lots of it. That makes me very happy and very proud. I've not seen anybody in a shirt and a tie. I've been here for three days. That makes me very proud. So I will just categorize these guys as people who just believe that their culture is strong enough they appreciate it well enough to dress in their own indigenous ways and not be so influenced by Western um, dictates about costume and dressing. And I know that in other parts of West Africa, people are proud to a, to, to a good extent about their you know, indigenous costumes and dresses. Um, it is, like I said at the beginning, it's just the educated ones. For a long time in the past as well, I was always happy to wear a shirt and a tie and a, and, and a, I mean, um, and a suit and a tie just because I feel, you know what, I need to feel cool. I, I saw Western dresses as a way to feel cool and feel a bit elevated. But as you grow older, you understand that this is just colonialism in a different light and you need to be able to readjust your mindset to wearing things that are suitable for you in your environment. I appreciate you know? the education, gentlemen. Uh, Mr. Dikwe, please. <clears throat> I think, uh, I, I think one of the footprints of colonization. Yes, the <laughs> I, I actually think that one of the footprints of colonization was to interfere with our identity as Africans, and yeah, uh, yeah. especially with the issue of dress code. I mean, Africans would be proud of what we wear, but somewhere in the subconscious, you feel like you're not too dressed for certain occasions if you're not in a suit and a tie. Mm. Uh, I don't know why uh, that has affected. Uh, in this age of globalization, I think people should be free to wear what they want to wear, but not losing that authenticity of, of where we come from. The problem that is happening now is that the Chinese are duplicating very important African wares. Like you see the, right. uh, the, the, the traditional right. American country cloth, for example, is a, is a fabric that China has has interfered with. You see very cheap ones now on the market. Before, if yeah. you saw a man in a country club shirt, it signifies a level of, of, of power or there is something sacred about it. It's not close you just find anywhere for any price. But now the Chinese have brought counterfeit uh, African clothes. We need to be able to make sure that that is not happening. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, I'm drifting into another section in terms of what's happening to our, our fabric. But we have to be able to arrest that. So, uh, yes, I mean, I, I like your city of Colorado to be able to state that for its artistic <laughs> vibe. Uh, Colorado gives me that city of art. <laughs> uh, so, people love how we dress, so they try to always wear it. Uh, but we should oh. also be proud in what we have. Uh -huh. And we should protect it. Yeah. We should protect what we have from the 
interference that China and other places are having on, on our fabric and, and so forth. So I, I wanted to comment on the trip that uh, 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 Mr. George, Dr. George spoke about. I I think as in from an institutional standpoint, I don't think uh, the government is doing anything about it. I know that individual teachers try to do field trips. Uh, personally, uh, I've done a few of them with students uh, as one way of, of exposing them to the potential we have at home. So when I went to Pata Week, for example, uh, one of the questions uh, I have with the uh, uh, what's that with the, the guests at Pata Week is to take people to Pata Week to, to just sit there and create because it's a space that allows you to think. And it, it gave me that glory island experience when I went to Senegal, uh, where you'll be able to uh, imagine the slave trade and see and look into the future and see what can you come up with. And there are many places across our country that we have to look at. So we have to be able to teach history deliberately. Uh, when I was uh, uh, teaching in, in, in Liberia, I would take students, I would always give them something practical as part of my evaluation. I would take them beyond the classroom. So it might be a presentation that you might have to visit an actual place and get to see what's happening. In, that will inform how you relate to what you are studying in the classroom. So the uh, concept uh, about continuously exposing students to these things, there are many places to visit, even across the continent, I mean, across our individual countries. I don't think it's that expensive to put students on the bus and take them to Freetown, for example, and to see what kind of uh, similarities we have in history. There were free slaves who came to Chevrolet Island in Freetown. Uh, there's a scholar and intellectual called Edward Wilmer Blatting that both countries want to own, both Liberia and Sierra Leone. But he's a pan African scholar, you know. So uh, I think we should be able to drive students to Ghana and see the Museum of W.E.B. Du Bois or to Nigeria by road and expose students to uh, Freedom Park, for example, in Lagos and its history with, with the slave trade and all that. So I think that we should be able to. Uh, uh, on the trip for its history the history that you know if you went to a place in real life and you were exposed to the history of that place there's no way you can forget about it uh it's going to be powerful it's as powerful as storytelling uh it's it's more powerful than learning it in a classroom so we should just be able to reinvent education in a way that our students are exposed to the realities and learning by practical means. And we need good teachers in the classrooms, <laughs> visionary teachers who will be able to uh, expose. So Mr. Uh, Dr. George, thank you for that again. I hope we can collaborate at some point because uh, that's yeah, what I, I do here sometimes. I'll be in Monrovia. So you just touch on that. Okay. We're, we're, willing to, we're willing to say, to loan Dr. George a library for two years. So that's what okay. you <laughs> Yes, been very awesome. I know that both of you have written books, and sorry, uh, I didn't tell you guys about this. I don't know if you have a copy of your book that you can show out to people and tell them where they can find your copies. I know, Pelu, you run uh, Walkabout, uh, which you take people on different trips uh, on journeys in Nigeria. So uh, can you guys show your books and tell people, can we find it on, Am on Amazon? Or oh, okay. Or can, you find it? can you find your book on uh, where we can find your book? Okay, so quickly, um, unfortunately, I didn't, I didn't travel with any of my books, so I don't have any, any copy here. But um, if you wanted to have a sense of um, what books I, uh, where would I say? Okay, anyway, um, I have a website, um, travel.ng, T-R-A-V-U.ng. Okay. Uh, we've been able to upload um, some e-copies, you know, e-versions of certain things that I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, if you go there, you'll find it. You know, um, T R A V U dot N G. That's my publication promoting my travels within Nigeria. Um, I have one of my books or two on Amazon, but it might be difficult to find it because I haven't really promoted it so much. But if you go to T R A V U dot N G, you will be able to find e copies of my books and my magazine, and you'll be able to read it for free just to get a sense of the work that I've done, you know, um, over this time. 
Thank you very much for that. All right, gentlemen, I know you, you have to go, um, but you know, I'm not gonna leave our, our uh, viewer without getting his question answered. So the question he wants to see how honest you both are. Uh, this is where the biases <laughs> are gonna come in, right? One representing Nigeria, one represent Liberia. So now this, this viewer wants to know, which country in West Africa has the most tourist uh, attractions? <laughs> oh man, Pelu, Pelu left. Who's, who's, who's going first? <laughs> no, Pelu left. I mean, he had a question and he left. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I, I'm I'm going to answer anyway. Oh, before I can go there, there's a copy of Scary Dreams. It was my book. It's an anthology of the Liberian Civil War. You can find this on Amazon. It's a collection of poems that tell a history of the Liberian Civil War. It's called Scary Dreams. So just go on Amazon and type in Scary Dreams, the play, and be alone, and you will see the link to this book. Uh, as well as Yearnings of a Traveler, my first book. I don't have a copy right now. It's also available on Amazon, Yearnings of a Traveler. You can also find that. And then most recently, a children's book called Green Bee of Fame. It's a book written for early learners about sanitation, which is a major issue in Liberia. So it's a book to promote sanitation and it's a way around young and early learners in Liberia. It's called Green Bee of Fame. It's not available on Amazon yet. I'm selling it for hard copies in Monrovia. So once again, it's Carry Dreams, Yearnings of a Traveler, book on Amazon, and then Green Bee of Fame is a book for early learners. It's also um, available in hard copies in Monrovia. So now, this is how I want to answer that question in terms of which country has the most potential in, for tourism. I, I, I honestly think that every country has a level of potential. So we need to leverage on uh, what, what, what my friend described as a chain reaction of tourism. For example, uh, 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 a very good friend of mine told me that if you went to Ghana, for example, and you came from the diaspora, whatever, and you came to Ghana for Africella or whatever is happening there, there should be a link that once you're in Ghana, there are also things to do in West Africa. For example, go to Monrovia, to surf or go and visit the part that we were forced but go and visit this place so there are things to do in ghana in liberia maybe in Sierra Leone or in nigeria so every country has to build a network of what to do in many different places because you find all the things in one country for example so let's take for example ghana has the door of no return and this was where the slaves left and went to uh, the Midwest, uh, the, the Atlantic. Now, the, the slaves did not come back to Ghana. They left Ghana and left. They went to uh, the Caribbean, they went to America, ever. Where did the slaves return? They came back to Monrovia. They went to Severlin. So when the free slaves came back, when the ACS and other organizations were looking for slaves to return to Africa, they not send them back to Ghana, they send them to Liberia and to several them. So that's the land of return. Those are the countries where the slaves came back. So if you want to go to Ghana and see where your fathers left, you must complete that journey by going to where to return. So if you come into Ghana as part of the black diaspora seeking answers about slavery, you can't complete the journey in Ghana. You have to go to Ghana and you come to Monrovia and you go to Chevron Island, depending on where your people resettled. So that gives you a holistic package of what to expect in different countries. So probably both countries can say to explore Ghana, Liberia, Severin or Nigeria, get a flight for this price. And on this, on this ticket, you can visit these countries. You can do... So, it can be like a package. The tourism industry can come together, build a package, and then they can sell it to those who are in the diaspora. So that if you want to get a complete hit of slavery, you can't come and stop in Ghana because they said do of no return. And they never came back to Ghana. They said they did not. They came back in other countries. So that's sort of a link. So I would say that in terms of the most potential, there has to be a package. And these countries have to come together, connect their histories, and be able to build a package that benefits each country differently. 
Okay, thank you so much, uh, like Pele. We we're so glad you took our time to be with us this evening, and uh, we look forward to having more discussion with you. And definitely, when I'm in Monrovia, I'll look you up so that we can we can share ideas. I have some ideas, uh, so we can share and see where we go from there. But thank you, and we look forward to and to those of you who have just joining us, and we are closing now. We have been having two awesome guests. Liberia leading poet um, who have won many awards and also uh, the Mandela Foundation fellow, um, Mr. Lepele Yamalo, uh, is joining us from Monrovia, Liberia, and CNN 2010 uh, travel journalist of the world of Af for West for Africa, rather, Mr. Pelu Awufisu well, was with us. He has his TV channel called Walk About, where he walks around Nigeria showing different parts of Nigeria and parts of West Africa. He's currently in Cotonou and he's having a uh, language barrier with his internet, so we lost him there. So thank you so much, and uh, do have a good evening. Uh, uh, if you stay around, Sherry and myself will just wrap up, and then we can we can talk a bit if you. Okay, Mr. Sheriff, uh, I'm sorry that uh, you don't know the continent very well, but uh, it was good that I think the conversation um as i said i've been i've traveled extensively from nigeria all the way to liberia by road by air by whatsoever possible and and it's a it's a great thing what our guests share with us is great knowledge great wisdom in okay. fact where one of the things that 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 you have in kotonou where Pelu is right now we talk about it but now on the show there's a festival called the voodoo festival in in, 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 yeah. in, in, in the republic it brings millions of people every year millions of people come to um, go down to a place called guida and they celebrate uh they celebrate uh, a voodoo uh, you know people mm. you know voodoo is practiced in in the caribbean they practice in brazil so you have people coming from from all around once a year that's on this and there was one year the pope the pope pope, pope john paul the second when he was alive one year he 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 opened the voodoo festival so um, we have a lot of cultural things we need to i mean a lot of places to visit in liberia beside patawi there's a sapo uh, forest there's labasa there's uh mm -hmm. there's uh the gola forest there's uh uh what the other places uh, as uh, Monrovia, the the uh, the Snapper Hill, the Blue uh, Lake, the Mayonic Temple, the Blue Lake, and we have very beautiful, very beautiful water system in Cape Town. Very good, mm -hmm. very relaxed. Just be on the water and then to drive to ride on the Simpo River is an is an awesome thing. So, I hope that those of our guests, our friends out there who's listening and thinking about the next awesome place of vacation, perhaps you want to plan for Disney World. You may think about just flying to West Africa. And for my friend with Rivers S Pro, I think every country in West Africa has a lot of touristy attraction. It's just that there are two, two countries in West Africa, one country in West Africa that have really, really marketed tourism, and that is Ghana. So Ghana has marketed it. But when you go to Nigeria, almost every state, every city in Nigeria, you have different cultural festivals. You have a lot of stuff to see. I have even uh, in Imo State, you can um, look at the importance of snake in the African culture. Um, and you, if you go to to, to Kotonu, you have the what we talk about the Voodoo Festival. We also have posts that people left uh, for for uh, into in the time of slavery in Kotonu. If you go down to to Senegal, there's also places there. Senegal also marketed tourism to us compared to Ghana. But then in Liberia, there are so many things you have to see. The where the Providence Baptist Church, where our constitution was signed, uh, this place in Clay Ashland, where the originals they, they had the, the constitutional meetings and other things, uh, Barclayville, where you have a very beautiful uh, 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 attraction in that area. So, uh, Mr. Sheriff, yes, sir, I'm here. No, I mean, basically, um. Yes, I don't know the continent too well. I've only been privileged to travel to two uh, West African countries, uh, Sierra Leone being one. And the, a second one was actually just kind of skimping through it. You didn't stay too long. It was it was Ghana. Just stayed there for a little bit and it just went through it. But yeah, I mean, 
I can definitely agree with everything else that the guests actually highlighted. I think Liquid made a very important point. The whole idea of maybe just marketing or uh, tourism attractions, I think it is such a beautiful thing. People who go to the Bahamas, for example, they will buy the package, but the package is not, is not just taking you to Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you stop along the way, especially if you're on a cruise. You stop along the way and you go to this country and this, this other country and, you know, to the Cayman Islands. So all of these things are actually people sitting and being very smart and making int intentional decisions to make sure that they are actually marketing tourists and they make it to be a valuable thing. I think one thing, too, that I have to say, though, Dr. George, like most of these other African countries that you you highlighted, Nigeria, you know, um, Benin, for example, the Wida Festival, uh, Voodoo Festival, I've only read about it and I have seen documentary on it. However, those countries, Senegal, for example, those countries, they were very intentional in creating a place, creating a space, marketing that place, right? Mm -hmm. And and. and you know, the door of no return, for example, in Ghana, it is a very intentional design, intentionally a uh, preserved area that people from all over the world still come to learn how in the world did this happen? You know, but, you know, when you come to our library, I'm, I mean, I'm not saying the place is still back, backstage here, yeah? but we need to do a little bit more work of pre preserving some of those places. We need to preserve those places and we need to make the historical markers very prominent that people will want to come in. I mean, right now, if I went to Monrovia, yeah, there are places that I want to see. I got my list of places I want to visit when I get to Liberia in March. I got my list of places I want to visit. I think Batawi is one of those places. And um, But I think we can do a better job of preserving those places and being very intentional that when people come, they will have escort, they will have people that will tell them the history of those places. I think that's what people want, just like we have in these other African countries. But other than that, it was a great conversation. I think I learned a lot from the two uh, gentlemen on the show today. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. So thank you very much, uh, our friends in Viewer Land. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Share the show. You can still share it. People can still watch on YouTube after a year. Uh, it's been good being in your living rooms, in your dining rooms, on your cell phone, wherever you're watching us from. And on next month, we'll be on the third Sunday. We're going to have another edition of This Could Be You. We're going to have an awesome Liberian that is going to join us. So we look forward, we look forward to that. And I look forward to seeing you the third, uh, the third Sunday of the month of February. And next weekend, we're going to be here again. We're going to be having an awesome panel discussion, still looking at the year 2023 and different things that is on our mind. So join us again next week. God bless you and do have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead.